Hey guys, how's it going? It's Mike with the Ongoing Restoration. Hope you're doing well whenever you happen to be watching this video. Um, I just got back from church and uh, we had a really awesome um, testimony meeting today. Um, and it really got me thinking about uh, the general conference that we just had. Um, there's been a lot of uh, talk you know, on the internet, and also, uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, been discussing General Conference, of course, with uh, family and friends, and um, it's really interesting. So, I, I actually wanted to talk to you about General Conference and, and why we have it. Um, for those of you who uh, maybe aren't members and are watching this video, and or if, you, if you're new to the church, um, also... Uh, if if you are a member of the church and uh, have never really uh, thought about that, I'd like to uh, discuss some quotes and and uh, share some opinions. And um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So uh, Article of Faith number nine says, We believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now the Lord instructed the prophet Joseph Smith and that several uh, that these several elders composing this church of Christ are to meet in conference from time to time for the purpose of conducting whatever church business is necessary to be done at, at the time. You can find that in Doctrine and Covenants section 20, verses 61 through 62. About two months after the organization of the church, the first conference was held on June 9, 1830. The prophet Joseph Smith recorded the following concerning this first conference. Our numbers were about 30, besides whom many assembled with us who were either believers or anxious to learn, having opened by singing and prayer, we partook together of the emblems of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We then proceeded to confirm several who had lately been baptized, after which we called out and ordained several to the various offices of the priesthood. Much exhortation and instruction was given, and the Holy Ghost was poured out upon us in a miraculous manner. Many of our number prophesied, whilst others had the heavens open to their view. And that is found in the History of the Church, Volume 1, um, is that pages 84 to 85, I believe. So it was really interesting to, to see, you know, what went on during the first general conference of the church back in 1830. Um, you know, the way we experience conference now is entirely different. Um, you know, I remember getting dressed in my Sunday best and, and going to church, and more often than not, we sat in the overflow. <laughs> and uh, I remember my dad would keep, you know, nudging me to, to stay awake, especially, you know, my, my first uh, uh, year or two in, in, uh, as an ironic priesthood holder, going to the priesthood session at conference. <clears throat> But uh, it's really interesting to see <clears throat> what took place um, in that first conference in 1830. They, they partook of the sacrament, which we, we don't do. <clears throat> and uh, then they confirmed several who had been baptized, uh, I guess previously. And uh, they called and ordained several to various offices of the priesthood. So we do have like sustainings, which is, you know, another thing that we experience in general conference, um, which I'll, I'll get to later, but uh, really interesting, you know, how uh, we, we are spiritually fed um, by the, the word of God that has given by the general authorities of the church. Now, I actually, I remember being told while at the MTC um, that the talks were given over certain topics re repeatedly, you know, like faith and repentance, 
et cetera, uh, because of the new members uh, coming in to the church each year and they're needing to be instructed on basic principles. President David O. McKay um, summarized the purposes of General Conference. Uh, one, to inform the membership of general conditions, whether the church is progressing or retrogressing economically, ecclesiastically, or spiritually, to commend true merit. Now, as I'm going through these, uh, try to think of examples in, in this last conference that we had of these um, um, scenarios that, that President McKay is listing. Okay, so let, let me go back over uh, the second one. So the first one was to inform the members or the membership of general conditions, whether the church is progressing or retrogressing economically, ecclesiastically, or spiritually. Two is to commend true merit. Three, to express gratitude for divine guidance. Four, to give instruction in principles and doctrine in the law of the gospel. Five, to proclaim the restoration with divine authority to administer in all the ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to declare, quoting the apostle Peter, that there is none other name under heaven given among men that Jesus Christ, than Jesus Christ, whereby we must be saved. And six, to admonish and inspire to continue in greater activity. And that was uh, from President David O. McKay in the conference report, October 1954. That's where you can find that reference. Uh, President Howard W. Hunter taught that general conference is a time to strengthen our testimonies and resolve to improve our lives. Conference time is a season of spiritual revival when knowledge and testimony are increased and solidified that God lives and blesses those who are faithful. It is a time when an understanding um, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is burned into the hearts of those who have the determination to serve him and keep his commandments. Conference is the time when our leaders give us inspired direction in the conduct of our lives, a time when souls are stirred and resolutions are made to be better husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, more obedient sons and daughters, better friends and neighbors. So, you know, every time we go to conference, uh, you might g go from one extreme to the other, feeling like inspired to then feeling completely humbled. That's what the gospel is all about. It's about building us up but it's also about humbling us and, and reminding us of uh, our relationship to our Heavenly Father and that we are all beggars, uh, like it says in the uh, book of Mosiah. So Harold B. Lee quoted Ralph Alder Waldo Emerson explaining the need for revelation. This is an interesting quote. Ralph Waldo Emerson says, the Hebrew and Greek scriptures contain immortal sentences that have been the bread of life to millions, but they do not have epical integrity, are fragmentary, and are not shown in their order to the intellect. Nor can the Bible be closed until the last great man is born. Men have come to speak of revelation as somewhat long ago given and done, as if God were dead. That injury to faith throttles the preachers and the goodliest of institutions become an uncertain and inarticulate voice. The need was never greater for revelation than it is today. And that was a quote, like I said, from Ralph Waldo Emerson um, that he gave uh, from an address at the Harvard Divinity School, July 15th, 1838. In the very first meeting of the church, uh, like I was talking about earlier in April, April 6, 1830, Joseph Smith asked those present if they were willing to accept him and Oliver Cowdery as their teachers and spiritual advisors. Everyone raised their hands in the affirmative. 
The Lord later affirmed that all things shall be done by common consent in the church, by much prayer and faith. Doctrine and Covenants section 26 verse 2. We have the opportunity in general conference to sustain the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, members of the Quorum of Seventy, and other general officers of the church by common consent. So that's another uh, reason that we um, have general conference is uh, to be able to sustain the, the leaders of the church worldwide, the, the general um, authorities and officers. Uh, Elder, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, our times are turbulent and difficult. We see wars internationally and distress domestically. Neighbors all around us face personal heartaches and family sorrows. Legions no fear and troubles of a hundred kinds. This reminds us that when those mists of darkness enveloped the travelers in Lehi's vision of the tree of life, it enveloped all of the participants, the righteous as well as the unrighteous, the young along with the elderly the new convert and seasoned member alike. In that allegory, all face opposition and travail, and only the rod of iron, the declared word of God, can bring them safely through. We all need that rod. We all need that word. No one is safe without it, for in its absence, any can fall away into forbidden paths and be lost. As the record says in 1 Nephi chapter 8, verse 28, and also verses 23 through 24, how grateful we are to have heard God's voice and felt the strength of that iron rod in this conference these past two days. And that quote is from the conference report, October 2006, from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. And lastly, um, President Russell M. Nelson in April 2019 taught us that the purpose of every general conference is to help us to hear him. As we study the talks over the next six months, I hope you and I can hear him and make the adjustments in our lives that we need to make, whatever they may be. I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.